Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our webinar series, Embracing Change. We have today a treat from Zurich, Mr. Stefan Linninger, um, who's the CEO of Kaiser Partners, the largest trust company in Liechtenstein. Stefan, there we go. Yes, hello. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you for taking the time this morning to be with us. Um, Pleasure. Really looking, really looking forward to having this, uh, I, I think, unique dialogue with you know the the approach that you have, which I find extremely fascinating and very aligned with with how we would love people to look at things. Um, you know, even though it's structure and it's it's the hard stuff, but really looking at the soft stuff that's behind it. So. If you don't mind, we'd like to, why don't we just really go back, go into it and, and maybe explain, you know, the, the outer and the inner that, that we spoke about, that you shared in terms of how you approach this whole process of, of structure. And, and it's, just, it's just beautiful. So I think let's start with that, if, if that's okay with you. And then, and then we go talking about some of the, the questions that a lot of us are, are asking ourselves that I know you've done some work with Iraj and, and Philip and a few others. So that, that would be beautiful. So mm. stage pleasure. is all yours, Stefan. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, honored and uh, a pleasure. So the, the two dimensions you're referring to in wealth planning, um, well, as everywhere in life, there is an inside world and an outside world. And the outside is very visible and tangible and the inside is not, and it's also somewhat mysterious. And uh, at the same time, this inner reality exists. And what I'd like to share is what is this inner reality of wealth planning? How does it affect wealth planning? And how could it be included? Because in, in my experience, often wealth planning is addressed as a rather technical faculty. I go to see um, my lawyer, I go to see my tax advisor, I yeah. sit down and think about setting up a last will, or maybe my previous uh, generation has set up trust instruments. And so there, there, there are those technical things in place. But in fact, well, if we think about a few examples, a family has set up a trust with a very valuable financial portfolio. Yeah? Okay. Or um, there is an inheritance and three descendants each get the same share. Or a third example, um, well, somebody dies intestate and, you know, surprisingly leaves no uh, um, conscious choice uh, with regard to planning in place. If we look at, 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 at those examples, they seem pretty straightforward, yeah. but to reflect and think, okay, what is behind? So there is a, a family trust with a value portfolio. Why has it been set up uh, in this manner? Is it because the assets are simply too big to be uh, put on the shoulder of the heirs? Is it that there are disputes amongst the heirs? Is it that uh, there is maybe some spendthrift um, or people who don't act responsibly with regard to the wealth? So the fact that there is a trust shouldn't lead us to conclusions immediately as why it's been set up and what its use is. The same, you know, you may have a last will where you have three people get the same thing. And that's actually a practical example of, of my experience uh, with working with clients is, well, family wants to be very, very fair. They say, all right, our main asset is a family business. Everybody should get one third in the shares. Fact is that two of the descendants haven't been involved in the business at all. And uh, they lived you know, wonderful lives on the back of the dividends they've received. And the third has invested 20 years and worked very, very hard to make the business what it is, has multiplied its value. And as is also often the case, hasn't been really paid at arm's length like an outside party. Uh, so is it really fair to say, all right, you know, we divide by three. So it's, it's all those, uh, it, it's all those aspects, um, value, value judgments, or, you know, a person who dies without leaving uh, a last will. Yeah. And, um, well, I once 
heard a joke that you know 99% of the people who die today thought they would live longer and probably that's that's uh, often often the case so why did the person do nothing is it because he or she didn't want to face their own mortality is it that there were huge conflicts in the family that would have had to be addressed but they remained under under the surface and i think here our approach is very much to see, okay, what are the outer realities and what are the inner realities? And as we know, inner realities, we all have our own. We don't know the others, but also families as a whole have inner realities. There are rules and um, behavior um, hidden, uh, conscious, unconscious. And um, it can be somewhat scary to think about this and, and address it. And at the same time, we feel this is something that needs to be tackled if you think about long-term and sustainable wealth and succession planning, not least because we have seen that the world is much more complicated today in terms of international planning as it has been um, in the past. And the newer, younger generations, they have higher expectations with regard to their mental health. They um, are also a very charitable uh, generation, uh, generally. Um, the notion of wealth and, and, and family wealth has changed big time. So the idea that, OK, I have created all of this and I'm going to impose my value system upon the next generation is very, very challenging. It's also very challenging to just say, okay, you know, um, the younger generation should be entitled to do whatever they want or, or wish um, with the wealth because it's family wealth. Well, maybe, yeah. So it's, it's those um, aspects and conversations that we, um, that we take, tend to, to uh, consider when, when we, when we uh, plan and we clearly feel, and I want to all also make very clear here I'm not um, how should I I should say maybe a bit, a bit of jargon I'm not pleading for esoteric wealth planning here I'm uh, pleading for the right balance and obviously and you know that's also be my my journey you need to have the best tax and legal and financial experts on your side when you do your wealth planning but be mindful that this may lead to one-sided components. And as we know, in, in, in the past, a lot has been tax-driven, for example. Yeah? You have your tax lawyer do all your planning, but you know, that may lead to a situation which is, is, is quite absurd because you are very wealthy, but um, you can't afford to live where you would like to live because maybe the tax isn't what you want. So you know, we, we feel that uh, the... the the whole planning should be looked at as a as a whole, and um, yeah, I mean it. It's also been in this in 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 this uh, you know context that well, you 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 what you are doing uh, for your clients is to think ahead and to um, make sure you prevent uh, some of the health issues that can come up. And from that point of view, I think it's very much the same here, even though, yes, uh, sometimes, you know, you have heart attacks, which are unexpected, and sometimes you can't avoid them. And you know, that's the same, that's the same thing with us, you do have divorces, you do have breakdowns of relationships. And, and that's um, sort of where we think we should, we should um, help clients uh, get a little bit deeper. So, um, so I can I can imagine when it's a new structure, people being a lot more open. But when it's an existing structure and you start bringing this kind of thought process to it, I mean, is there a lot of resistance, or do you feel because of what's happened in the last two years in the world, there's a shift in the approach? Right. I, I know you're, um, you're busy. Yeah. Before, very, so very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting question. And you know. Um, should I say, no, normally, if things work, they aren't changed. So um, when are there big conversations about uh, wealth and succession planning? It's around certain life events. Okay. So someone divorces, 
um, someone dies, someone retires, someone new is born, someone moves to a new country. And generally, I must say, I'm very surprised by the level of openness that the younger and the older generation have on, uh, on the notion of planning and the sort of previous notion of saying, all right, you know, if I'm a founder or if I'm the one holding the button for the family now, I will do everything um, secretive and it's my decision and nobody else is changing very, very much. So there is much more dialogue. And I'm sure, you know, when you refer to sort of the last uh, two years, um, yeah, people are more aware of their vulnerabilities. And uh, when people generally uh, are vulnerable, uh, there is more, more openness. And um, so from that point of view, um, resistance, it will come in the process. Normally, when we do uh, a plan, you know, um, everything sounds okay, uh, interesting what you do, and we would like to have the balance and, and all of this. Often, uh, once you put the measures in place, well, behavioral change will be required. And here I may uh, refer, even though that may be a later topic, you know, to something like family, family constitution. Family constitutions are very popular today. And there is a whole industry that has specialized on doing, I'd say, off the shelf, boilerplate family uh, foundations. And um, you know, you may go to see your advisor and say, we need a family constitution, they do it for you and, you know, best practice and so on. But does it actually fit your family is question number one. And is it, is it done organically so that it works? That's question one. And question two is, um, well, how will it be implemented in practice? And a lot of people think that uh, having a family constitution is the end of the, the process. Actually, it's the beginning of the process because that's when the hard work starts. That's when you have to convert paper into behavior. And uh, that's very, very challenging. And that's where we normally see resistance because again, you know, some people may need to step up. Some other people may need to step back. And um, that's when normally when, when individuals and families do need uh, do need support and and uh, and help. Yeah. All right. So let's take a step back. Let's take a step back and let's address some of the questions that we spoke about before before we got mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Why is wealth so emotional? Like, well, what's going on? Like, it's money, right? Well, it's, but, it's, a, it's 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 a big it's a big uh, mystery to some degree, and I mean you've. You've mentioned a recent publication uh, that Iraj uh, has been editing, and I contributed a little article there on wealth and succession planning and did a bit of research, although very, very superficial, I have to say. So I don't want to sound in any way or form scientific here. I'm, I'm not a pro. I'm, you know, I'm a lawyer and I'm a wealth planner, uh, intrigued with the psychology of wealth. But um, one, one thing that's uh, quite, quite interesting is... Um, Thinking, uh, thinking about wealth as uh, in the context of survival. So um, there is um, a, a German a Baltic philosopher, uh, Kaiserling. Um, he was quoted by Roberto Assagioli, an, an Italian um, uh, psychologist. And they talked about this concept of eternal hunger. So somehow, um, in early man, and as we all know, 99% of our genes are sort of biologically determined. And yes, we have a mind and the faculty of the mind, but somewhere in our genes are very strong drives. And there is a drive to survive. And um, this concept of eternal hunger um, related to, 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 to wealth. I've come across something that scientists call hedonic hunger. That means, okay, um, certain substances I have no control over because my brain doesn't tell me I now had enough. And that's mostly fat and sugar. So um, if I eat fat and sugar, and that again is biologically 
uh, determine probably, I have no mechanism to tell me now is enough. And that's also back to, all right, you know, an early, early man, early woman, um, I found fat and sugar. I made sure I absorb it uh, because it may be a long time until I, I get it again. And that somehow led me to say, okay, maybe there is a parallel between this concept of eternal hunger, hedonic hunger, uh, with regard to wealth, because there are many studies, and UBS did one a few years back, where they interviewed people whose net assets were more than 30 million US dollars. So by any standard, a lot of money. And one would think, okay, you know, if I had 30 million, I would, I would feel economically safe. But interestingly, the majority of the people that the study found um, having more than 30 million net don't feel economically safe. So somehow I think the, the conclusion, and there is a very interesting neuroscientist who died uh, um, a few years ago, Jan Panksepp, um, he's looked at the brain in terms of primary and secondary, secondary circles. And well, as we know, if we are frightened or in anger, we are mostly in our primary circles of, of the brain. And um, well, if it's about survival, uh, we're very easily triggered back in our early, early man, uh, brains to to worry and say okay we can't have enough so 30 million is not enough and of course you know there are all other rationales um, around there too it may be that I have 30 million but my partner has 100 million so I feel poor and I'm not talking about this I'm really talking about do I feel I'm economically safe uh, with 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 30 million so my blunt theory here is as there are some substances like fat and sugar where we can never get enough the same brain circles are being activated when it comes to wealth. And unless I, um, as you just said, you know, step back and, and reflect, and I get into my secondary circles in my brain, where I do say, okay, wait a minute, objectively speaking, I have two houses, I have, you know, income, I have, I'm fine, um, then um, I, I may not feel economically safe. Now, why is this relevant? I think it's very relevant in the context of succession planning, when there is either fighting in the family or where there is existential fear. Well, will my parents look after me? Yes or no. Or if I live off my parents, what if they close the tab? That may trigger existential, existential fear. And that may then lead me to think, oh, um, even if I get 15 of the 30, this will, this will not be enough. So the complexity of of um, emotions around wealth, I think is something we'd be well off to, to research. But what seems quite clear is if there is trust in the family, if there is trust in the relationships uh, of the individuals involved, those mechanisms will very likely be less uh, severe than they will be if there is fighting. Yeah? And um, another very interesting question is, why is it so hard to transition from one generation to the next? And as you seem, you know, okay, there is this sort of eternal hunger or I can't feel economically uh, safe component. Um, let's look at the role of parents in uh, sort of our, our biological uh, parts. And if we think about it a bit bluntly, again, this is evolutionary biology. Well, um, my mother is hugely important for me because first of all, she gives me life. And secondly, in the first one, two years, I will die without my mother. The role of the father already is, uh, especially in, in sort of tribal circumstances, much less clear. Probably the father is here to make sure that we are part of the group because if we are not part of the group, we'll probably, not, we'll probably not survive. But then the father becomes quite irrelevant very, very quickly. And that's also why in our genes, somehow we tend to orientate ourselves very quickly as we leave the age of the toddler vis-a-vis -vis our peers. Because again, one of the 
most important survival mechanisms is to belong and to belong to the group because if, if we're expelled we will starve or we will die for you know whatever other dangers are out there in times of early man and somehow the theory here is too that these mechanisms still exist so by nature i have to break with my parents and orient myself towards the group and the peers and well that creates a lot of conflict in generational transitions because on the one hand of course um, if I'm part of an entrepreneurial family or you know uh, need to think about succession um, I'm part of my family I want to be loyal to them but I have to go out and align with my peers find new ideas and um, go through the process of individuation and well, that by nature creates conflicts and I will bring new ideas to the family. I will have different approaches to, to many things and to reconcile this is really, really hard. And again, you know, it, it may be a boilerplate to talk about it because we all know that's the case. That's what young adults need to do. But then in reality, in, in, in real life, to accept that maybe your daughter or your son are not interested or don't show an interest through a certain stage of their life um, into what I'm doing or into the family business, or they have to deny it to go their own ways. It's very, very critical not to break down the relationships because a lot, again, can go wrong emotionally there. And um, yeah, if I start to punish, for example, I say, okay, you know, you don't have to enter the family business, but then you can also live poor. Um, and I don't provide, then again, I'm back into the existential, uh, into the existential, um, existential component, but probably we, uh, I'll, I'll leave it here. You see, it is also a very emotional topic for, for me and I can observe it in many, many uh, scenarios and I feel it's very worthwhile to, to be addressed because it also gives some comfort to the individuals and families who are involved to see, you know, okay, that's normal and it has to happen. And you know, in a way, in, in, in some cases, as we also know, the worst thing is to happen. And that's one of the challenges in wealthy families or where there is big family coherence. I may not go through this process of individuation and becoming myself so I may not be a strong leader which is required for the next generation or even worse I may wait with my own individuation until the rulers of the family are gone and then we are in chaos and conflict because the system isn't ready um, in, 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 in terms of its functionality to, 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 to move on. That's, you know, so, so one I'm hearing from you about obviously the fight or flight, the survival mechanism, right? And, and the lack of understanding with that, you know, with that old brain in terms of, of how much is enough or how much is safe, quote unquote. But what I'm also hearing here is that on one hand, we, I mean, I'm going to speak now, I have two, two sons who are 18 and 20. On one hand, we want, you know, great leadership and, and, and a future strength right to carry the baton quote unquote but at the same time are we mindful of some of the sabotage that we may be creating for self-actualization which you refer to as individualization right so it's so from your experience are you seeing that there's more blowing up in the face or are you seeing people now being a lot more creative to create that balance because they understand that without that leadership this is you know we're creating crutches and we have no empowerment, and it's just a recipe for the house to crumble, right? Maybe later, yeah. but it'll be sooner, right? Once the old regime, quote unquote, is no more. Yeah, I mean, I, I see much more, again, much more openness and willingness of um, people to, to engage. And this old uh, sort of dynastic uh, thinking of all right, you know, these are the rules, you live by those rules or yeah. you exit the family, they no longer work. That's very clear. So it needs to be a, a, a cross fertilization. But then, you know, at the same time, um, it's also a fact that normally the elder generations, they have experiences and they 
you know, there is the wisdom of age. Uh, and there is also the wisdom of, of youth, no question. But for me, the main goal uh, usually is to get the dialogue going between the generation, because this is what will make it fruitful. And if we think back into wealth planning, I think I'm shying away of um, sort of two autocratic structures, which are one way. And any planning needs to be um, adaptable. It's very important to set the values and to agree on the common joint set of values, but then uh, also, also move on. And I mean, one very interesting example, and uh, we've written a little bit about that, you've mentioned it in the invitation, is the Picasso family. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to need to get some papers here just to get some of the facts right. So when, when, Picasso, when Picasso died, um, first of all, he left no last will. So he did no succession planning at all. All right, you know, you may say Picasso was one of the greatest artists. Um, so it, it's none of his business to look after this. So when Picasso died, um, he left 1,880 paintings, 1,200 sculptures, 7,000 drawings, 30,000 prints, 150 sketchbooks, 3,000 ceramic works, two chateaus, three other homes, apartment and studios in different regions in France, securities and paintings of other artists, cash and gold in the millions. So um, if Picasso were alive today with these assets, he would be amongst the top 10 uh, globally in terms of wealth. So we're not talking about some you know, artists, so we're talking very, very substantial wealth. So he, he died interstate. Um, his estate had never been valued. Um, he had a number of children, as we know, quote unquote, legitimate, illegitimate uh, children. He left seven uh, legal heirs, wives, mistress to mistresses. Um, the age gap between the youngest and the eldest was 28 years. So, you know, I don't want to labor it too much, but a very, very relevant situation. And, you know, actually what happened is that 46 years after Picasso's death, the estate is still not properly sorted out of his um, family. Just two came to the funeral because there was uh, so much fighting. Over 30 million has been spent in, in litigation. So the family is effectively is, is, is destroyed. Yeah? So, okay, what, what, did, um, what did Picasso um, do or what can we learn from that? Well, I think to consciously ignore the need for wealth and succession planning is rather disastrous for uh, your loved ones. And you may not care about yourselves, but most people care about the people around them. And I'd say, well, from a wealth planning point of view, dear Mr. Picasso, you didn't care about your family and your, and your loved one. Then also, the, nobody knew the size of his estate or what was his and not so there was also you know the, a lot of fighting around who owns what and where is what and getting an inventory was terrible um nobody there to act on behalf of the heirs no unity um at all also he didn't think at all about conflict resolution mechanisms which is something extremely important because well as we know family is never idle harmony but to set the rules according to which um, fights are being dealt with relevant he 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 didn't he didn't do it and then well what what's also quite relevant here and maybe even more in in today's uh, world there was absolutely no principles around privacy um, protection of information and so on so the whole fighting was also out in the public and yeah completely completely disastrous so um what we see here is i think an example of two failures one is there was absolutely no legal regime in place and you know as our friend philip markovici says be mindful having no plan is a plan because something is going to happen if you die 
and you can influence it. And if you let it just happen, you don't influence it. So I think in, in wealth planning for, for us, one of the first questions is always, what do you want to achieve? What is important to you? And then to go through with, um, with our people, the question of, all right, what is in place now? And what will happen if you get hit by the proverbial bus uh, today? And what's also striking, uh, you know, Faisal, is most people don't know exactly what will happen if they were to drop off the perch today. They have a vague idea and they think, yeah, this, that, and the other. And then from a methodology point of view, I think it's really important to say, okay, you know what, tell me what will happen. And then we'll list those things that you think will happen. Maybe something else happened, but that what would happen. And is this what, what you actually want to happen? And um, normally it's far from, it's far from that. And it's, uh, you know, I'm also not suggesting people are complacent. Um, I'm not suggesting people aren't responsible in their planning. But very often um, there is just a partial view on, on things and um, thinking ahead with sort of the what ifs. It's also very simple. Okay, what happens if, what happens if? And I think here, another interesting example, if, if, if uh, you're fine with me continuing to, uh, yeah, and, uh, to go I, on I is- hope, I hope in a different direction, not, not somebody who just uh, left it to, let's hope it all works out. Okay, go ahead. Ah, well, it, 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 it's another example, which is uh, great from one point of view and not so great from another point okay. of view is the Vanderbilt, is the Vanderbilt family. Okay. So we know the Vanderbilts, they were in railway, they were really, really big. Um, Mr. Vanderbilt uh, had a wealth which was equal to about a third of the Fed's um, um, reserves at wow. his time. And um, he had some of his sons uh, in the business and especially one was very capable. And he said, you know what, to continue with the business, we need just one to, to hold the baton for the whole family. Yeah. So um, don't quote me on numbers, but I think he left 11 heirs, his wife and um, 10 or 11 children. And by last will, he said, okay, 99% uh, of the assets of the, of me Vanderbilt goes to my one son because he's capable and he's running the business successfully and the one percent goes to the other so as you can imagine um was all style nobody knew about it really when he died the last will was opened and there was a huge fight in the family about this now the good thing for late Mr Vanderbilt was the will was upheld it was valid so his one son did get uh, the, the 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 business um, however, he died a few years later, and by that time the family has been destroyed. And also, Mr. Vanderbilt's son, who has seen his siblings and so on um, suffer from him getting everything, he had another notion of fairness, and he then divided in his estate the the business into equal shares. But the family was unable because the fabric's been destroyed; was unable to agree on anything. And um, there were some you know, people who lived very, very fancy lives. There were others who wanted. So basically it all tore apart. And what we learned from this uh, example is um, Mr. Vanderbilt was a businessman and he had a perfect solution in place for his business. So the business governance from that point of view worked, but uh, well, there are two things. He didn't consider the family governance side of things and cohesion in the family. In a way he didn't accept the power of family and that the group of a family uh, uh, can can have and that led to the um, end of of the, the, the Vanderbilt dynasty and also I think um, what he didn't really do well was to think about plan B and that's also something that we feel is very important in in wealth and succession planning to constantly think it's again it's a it's kind of a what if but um, have a plan B in place. And obviously he didn't think about the demise of his son. Uh, he thought his son would live forever or at least as long as needed to, to get things done. And, and it, um, it didn't, it, it, it didn't work. So um, it may be a bit depressing to use all these uh, uh, examples, but still at the end of the day, 
it's about um, us being able to learn from, from those examples. And uh, succession planning is always about choices. And it's never, it's never uh, perfect. Um, but where I think, you know, like in medicine, if I go to have an operation, um, I want to know what the facts are and what the consequences could be. Uh, I, think, I think it's called informed consent, right? Um, so that I can make my, my choice. And that's what I feel is really, really important. Um, it's not about rights or wrongs. Different people, different cultures, different families, they all have their own values. And it's okay if someone says, well, you should benefit from the family business. If you're in the family business, if you're not in the family business, well, you don't participate to, to the same degree. Um, that's a choice. Uh, fine. I have no moral instance uh, here. I may have my own views, which I may share uh, with, with uh, my clients, but it's the choice. And then let's make sure the choice is consistent and it's adding to the long-term prosperity of, of uh, the planning that's in place. So, so let's, now, let's now take a different approach. So for us as, as a family health office, our objective is to plan for the unexpected, right? To plan for, we just like, like COVID, right? It was all about how do we build resilience from a physical space, from mental, emotional space, from a relational space, so that we're able to embrace whatever comes our way, right? Now, if we take this philosophy to wealth planning, you're talking about scenarios, right? I mean, now you can't walk through every scenario possible. So now that's not about, that's not building resilience, that's if then statements, right? But how do you help families build that resilience, right? So that, because they don't know what's gonna happen, right? I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. scenarios possible, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and, and curveballs happen, right? We know, I mean, yeah. I've had a number of them myself, right? And, you know, but, here we are, we're still here, yeah. we're still moving forward. Right? Yeah. So, um, well, that's that probably the question you're, you're asking here. And I, and I think sort of, you know, from, from the top of my head, I would say it's about three things. It's about the right people, it's about the right processes, and it's about the right structures that are, uh, that are in place. And I would also uh, approach it in that order. Sometimes planning is done the other way around. Say, okay, you know what, Stefan, can you do a trust for me? I say, well, you know, of course I can do a trust for you, but is this what you need and want? You know, it's like I go to the pharmacy and say, okay, please give me an aspirin. Um, and the pharmacist says, okay, uh, thanks, that's $5 or five francs or whatever. Um, but is it actually the remedy that, that you need. I need. So I think very important in, in planning is um, to have thought and purpose before, before structure. Um, now, in, in terms of uh, people and the right people, uh, uh, also a, a, an example comes to, comes to mind. I was in front of a very successful emerging market entrepreneur and um, we had a few conversations and he liked what we were doing. And I said, well, you know what, Stefan, I trust you fully. So do my succession plan and I'll sign it off. And I said, well, how come? I says, well, you know, I don't have time to think <laughs> of this. And also, you know, I have to run businesses and it's not my expertise. And I think that's a deadly formula. You delegate too much to your advisors or you trust people too much. I think what is really important is you have to own the process. You need the right people to help you own the process. But where I see things go wrong, it's often when families delegate too much. And um, so you need to have the right people helping you with the planning, but you need to own the process. And you need to involve the right quote unquote people. Now, what are the right people? Again, that's for you to define. You may want to define your younger generation. You may want to involve your spouse. Uh, you may want to involve your parents. That's very, very um, individual. But I think 
one of the important steps for us is always to determine who should be part of the planning process. And here an observation too is, especially when there are family businesses, there are key people in any system which are not family. And more often than not, these people are being neglected. And I think that's a big mistake. So we also want to make sure these key people are there. Sometimes it's the CFO of a business. Sometimes it's a board member. Sometimes it's a nanny. Sometimes it's, you know, the, the key people um, who must be preserved for a smooth transition to the next generation. That's, that's uh, really very, very uh, important. Let's see, and Stefan, then, one thing. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Please, please. Now, so one thing I, I want to challenge you on is, like, so when I was diagnosed and they gave me a, a, you know, a protocol and it was one round every three weeks, but then they gave me the probability of survival, which was pretty much pathetic. I challenged them, right? Mm -hmm. Now, these are medical doctors. And then they, you know, we, we, we consulted with the founder of the cure and he came back with five rounds. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Now, most people in my position are not challenging an oncologist. How are they going to challenge Stefan, who's the CEO of such a huge, you know, enterprise or Philip or, or, or Peter or, you know, John Davis, whoever it is, right? I mean, they're all people in the space, right? So not, most people are not used to challenging the expert. So how are you able to create that safety or that, that, you know, that willingness to actually push back? Because without that, like I've, you know, I've sat across from people who are not challenging their mm. advisor. And as a result, yeah. are coming in, making you know, requests or, or, or whatever it is on the documentation that are completely yeah. not aligned with their values because they're yeah. saying they're the expert. I'm yeah. not. So they're relinquishing yeah. control. Like here you said, own the process. But if you haven't run, you know, not about running businesses or whatever, if you haven't owned processes in different ways, right? It could be your home. It could be a philanthropy. It doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. know what that means, right? Yeah. So how can we encourage? And just a footnote, everyone, please, please ask any specific questions, broad questions, anything that's coming up as as Stefan shares so that we can, you know, pick his brain while he's here because, you know, he's here. So, sorry, go ahead, Stefan. What, what do you feel in terms of, because I, I find that's very challenging. Yeah, no, it, it, it is, absolutely. And I think um, there's probably no magic solution uh, to that. What I do find extremely interesting and refreshing is here, sometimes, you know what, the younger generation is more blunt um, is more informed, is more challenging uh, to, to deal with. And that's, that's really, really good. Um, on the other hand, I think the answer is choose your advisors wisely. And that's also a very, very hard, uh, hard task. So um, yeah, but I, I don't mean that the advisor was, was, was malintended. The advisor mm -hmm prepared the mm. paperwork based on his or her values and what mm. he or she thought was in the best interest of the family. Mm. But mm. you understand, but it's not aligned because mm. they didn't challenge, right? So yeah. I'm talking about that piece, right? That, that we yeah. see it all the time, right? So we always, we always tell people, I say, when you go to your banker, you don't just go eeny, meeny, miny, bow and said, I want a banker from JP Morgan or from UBS. Mm. You actually mm -hmm. get a referral, right? Or, mm -hmm. or you do your homework. Same yeah. as the lawyer, same, but yeah. in the medical practitioners, a lot of them don't do that, right? Yeah. They surrender to the institution and hope for the best, or they end yeah. up in a, in, 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 in a hospital, right? I had somebody just last week, right? That said, oh yeah, I'm just going to go tomorrow to the hospital and, and, mm. and they'll figure it out. And I'm like, mm. why would you do that? Why would you mm. not book an appointment with a specialist that is specific for the issue at hand and, and just nip it, right? And, and, and we it's, did that, but it is, it, it is one of the big challenging questions, whom, whom, whom to trust and who, I mean, I think how, I, I can just say how I tend yeah. to handle this. And, and one thing is um, never give too much power to one person or to one institution. 
So it's good to have sparring partners and the right checks and uh, checks and, and balances. Yeah. And for me, for example, it's always very important to work with the advisors, the existing advisors and key people uh, of the client because they have knowledge and they have different perspectives that's yeah. one thing the second thing is it's very important to define how to get buy-in by all the stakeholders that are relevant and here you know also sometimes you sit around the table and there is one you know harmonious opinion but then you go and you talk to someone individually and you get a completely different picture and that's also something where i feel um every well, whether it's a, 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 a bank or a trustee, uh, an advisor, your protector can um, add value is by talking to people individually and taking in a way nothing for, for granted, challenge, challenge themselves. But again, probably to answer your question very specifically and precisely, it is hard. And I think it's one of the responsibilities of the older generation is to empower the young generation to think independently, to ask questions, and to give them the self-confidence. Because I've, you know, also seen scenarios where, um, at at some stage, the 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 uh, the old woman or the old man dies, and you're then, you know, sort of cited into a meeting room with a very distinguished individual who has been involved with the family for thirty years, and anyway then acts as if um, this were the new family, the, the new family uh, head. Um, and you know, that never, that never is a good idea in, in, in my view. Um, and that's also then a result of quote unquote bad planning. You know, if I have my, my lawyer um, with whom I've worked for 30 years and I tell him, you deal with my succession and you deal with my successors, well, maybe, my uh, children will not be able to deal with him. They will not dare to, but then they will find their own way. And that's normally when there is conflict and when, when there is uh, fighting. Yeah, no, but that's also another, right? I mean, we, you know, I, I've created a, a number of trusts and originally the trusts were going to continue. And now I just amended them where the beneficiaries have the option to liquidate, means to, to, to pull through because obviously my relationship with the trustee, even though it's irrevocable, right? And, and the, their relationship, we don't know, right? So maybe they begin, but they have the right to liquidate it because, and then, you know, move it elsewhere or, or move it elsewhere in terms of trustee even, they have that option as well. But before, yeah. you know, before that, I never thought of that option, right? Because, you know, you assume that this is somebody that's been your lawyer, for 30 years or whatever, you know, it's gonna it's gonna continue, but that doesn't mean that they will see eye to eye, like you said, with the next generation who just cannot and, relate. Yes. And I mean, you know, you you mentioned the issue of resilience in, in, in planning, and we've I think dealt with the, the, the people aspect. What you're now referring to is the governance of yeah. what structures you are setting up and processes, and that's very, very key too. Uh, you wanna have proper checks and balances in place. Maybe you want to give your descendants the right to terminate the trusts and take all the assets, but sometimes uh, you may not want this because yeah. you think, you know what, yeah. um, the money should be or the wealth should be here for two to three generations. Yeah. So I want to give them certain rights yeah. um, so that they don't have to uh, beg at their trustee yeah. and they don't become what we call trust fund uh, uh, kids. Yeah. And also, you know, you, you want to allow the next generation to self-realize, yeah. to develop their own talent. And that can be overwhelming if at the age of 21, I can pull uh, down a massive trust and I, I don't have to uh, work anymore for the rest of my, my days. This may not be good for my own well-being uh, or my own quote-unquote resilience. Um, uh, in terms of my, my mental health. So to build in the right mechanisms and balances there is really relevant. And that's also something that we see a lot is that um, trusts that have been set up for the past generations, they were sometimes quite, um, how shall I say, unclear 
about rights of beneficiaries. They were unclear about the values that drive the trust. So when you say what you do with existing arrangements, more often than not, it's about looking back at what has been the intention of those who settled the trust. Obviously, that's, that's always relevant, but also uh, to think more about the needs of the next um, generation. Uh, you don't want to leave full discretion to your trustee to decide whether your children should be able to afford uh, the certain lifestyle or should have a right to certain assets and so on. You may to want to very, very clearly define this. And also there we've de developed uh, you know, a, a little model which can sometimes, sometimes um, help. There are what we call legacy assets. And then there are like more financial assets and then there are personal assets, there are business assets. And when you think about wealth planning, um, one size doesn't fit all. So if you have a very old longstanding um, family estate or, or family business, you may not want to leave just the next generation uh, to decide um, to liquidate it all and take the money and go. You may want to put in some mechanisms so that the value is preserved for the coming generations or the business is preserved for the next generations. But uh, then, you know, uh, if you pass on a bicycle to the next generation, it would be quite foolish to put it into trust and say, well, you can never dispose of it. Um, and I'm deliberately using this absurd example, but show, you know, sometimes you want to give freedom to the next generation to fully this post, but in certain respects, you also want to lock in principles which are binding for, for generations uh, to come. And in our experience, there is often not enough differentiation of the nature of uh, different assets in, in estate planning. And that is, that's, uh, that's really important. Because at the end of the day, um, as you said, you know, every um, piece of wealth is a means to creating relationships and um, you define by programming quote unquote the asset it's accessible to whom under what circumstances to what degree these are all value judgments that you make but they work as incentives to the next generation and here again you know it's is it right to um, give the Porsche or Ferrari at the age of 18? I don't know, some family think so. Is it right to wait until um, the old woman and man has died? And before that, uh, you know, uh, your, your heirs don't get any uh, financial independence, but have to live their own lives. Maybe it's right, maybe it's, it's wrong. Maybe they will clap hands when you are gone because then finally they will get it. But at the current life expectations of 100 years, I may myself be 80 years old and, until I, 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 I inherit. And these are really hard questions to, um, to address. And there is no right or wrong, but they should be talked about because you do give incentives to the next generation in the way you are making accessible the wealth of, of the family. And in terms of transparency, right? Like that's another topic, right? That, that can hurt or maintain relationships, right? What level mm -hmm. of transparency? I mean, we've had, I remember it's, you know, one of the families we cared for came with a letter of wishes and he said, what do you think? You know, and I said, you know, I read it and we made a few changes in terms of protecting his, you know, his wife so that you know, I always joke, make sure she's continuously shoe polished. And, um, and then, and then I said, uncle, can you, can you consider something? He's like, what? I said, why don't you read this at your next family meeting? Why are you waiting? Maybe if you read it, they may, they may actually plan to, to execute your letter of wishes while you're around. Why yeah. wait? Yeah. To even understand or know. Right. So to in terms of transparency, what, what are you seeing? Are you seeing more of it or is it still, you know, held close to the chest? To me, there are, I'd say, three levels or layers of transparency um, involved. One is, and that's something to absolutely avoid, 
if only one person knows what assets are around. And that often happened in emerging market wealth yeah. Yeah. Uh, scenarios. I have built a business, I have assets all over the world, but nobody knows. That's yeah. very, very dangerous. So you need to make sure that those you care about, at least someone knows, and there is some form of inventory of yeah. assets yeah. Um, so that you know all the people will not run away with the money. Second question is on how much transparency do I have within the family? Again, that's value judgment. I think one needs a responsible approach there. I wouldn't tell my you know, 11 year old, well, you will get X then. And well, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it may also be right if the 11 year old is very mature, but I think there it's good to have a phased approach. Yeah, your 11 year old probably can Google you anyway and will know, oh, that, by the way, I know you have this, that, the other. So I think you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't take your family, um, how should I say, well, you, you shouldn't think they're stupid. Yeah, yeah. there is a lot of transparency <laughs> yes. uh, uh, today, but I think depending on the stage of development, uh, you, can, you can share what, what uh, can be shared. And even if you know the family may know there is a business, you may not want to uh, show the P and L uh, whilst they're you know 14 or 16 because they will not be able to handle it. And uh, what we see with uh, um, a lot of families is that there are you know family reu reunions, yeah. and depending on certain life stages or maturity levels, and also subject to you signing up, um, up to the terms of the family and the family constitution, you do get, you do get access. Then the whole new and interesting question is going to be all right, you know, do spouses have access to this, to yeah. these rights or, you know, are you bound by um, confidentiality? So I, I think transparency is good, but it needs to be in a way regulated. It's not zero or 100, but yeah. it's a, a bit of transparency. And maybe it's good to say, well, you know what, you'll never starve. Um, but it may not be good to say, all right, you know, you will be able to buy this and that. And the third, that leads to the third component of transparency, that's um, privacy. And I know that, you know, there are all registers and, you know, some, there are people who think that everybody's tax return should be in front of the Wall Street Journal. That's definitely wow. not my understanding. Yeah. And, um, well, there we are into, uh, you know, how families manage their privacy and that is a, an extremely important topic and it starts very very early on um, social media and so on um, you've done a webinar a webinar on this so I think um, a really important so that I, I see the three levels of, of transparency but yeah. you know one thing is also if you don't share anything at all yeah. then there may also be notions of grandeur and what you don't know, normally you may think is bigger than what it is. And an interesting question here is, you know, well, moving from one generation uh, to the next, there will always be a divided by. So it may also be important for the next generation to understand, okay, you know what, if it's going to be divided by four, you know, life may look a little bit different unless yeah. you yourself contribute substantially to what, yeah. what, what, what is there. So, yeah. Now that's... All right, we have, we're almost at the end of the time. We have a few more minutes. So is there something that we didn't touch upon that you'd like to share before you give us, you know, a few, maybe a few nuggets to think about, to reflect on, or a reminder of what you already said so that we can, you know, take this home and, and really think it through so that um, we're a lot more mindful and, and cohesive and coherent, like you said, in terms of the impact on our relationships as we make these choices? I think, um, again, you know, wealth and succession planning can be a scary, a scary topic. It doesn't have to be. And of course, you know, thinking about, uh, oh, um, where do I have to file my taxes? Can I now travel to this country? Should I get that, that passport? And um, how is this banker doing? Can be, can be, uh, very uh, overwhelming. So again, I think what I'd, uh, what, what, what I'd share as, as nuggets is relatively simple. I think um, being mindful of this inner and outer side of, yeah. of things, systems of, of uh, families, we all live in our own reality. 
and we take it for, for granted. So this systemic view in planning, definitely. I think the second thing is, uh, yeah, choose your people wisely with, with, with uh, whom you work and challenge yourself and protect also, you know, your family from, from, from yourself. Be open uh, to, to be uh, challenged, but also be open to, 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 to challenge. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's the, that's the simple formula. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Once again, I just uh, want to remind everyone that the approach that you have, and we've discussed at length in terms of the whole audit process and onboarding process, it's, you know, it's, it's something very unique, very, um, you know, I think special and aligns with us, especially in terms of taking that whole, you know, the holistic approach in terms mm -hmm. of the whole family system. We look at the human system, but you're looking at the family system. So again, hats off for, for that approach. I think it's something really incredible and, and needs to be honored and respected and celebrated. So very good. Thank you. Again, thank you for your time today. Thank you for sharing um, and really appreciate that. Thank you everyone for being here. Next week, we're going to change and switch gears. Vanessa Wong is going to be here next week to talk about the meaning of life and, and, and more from a psychology perspective and you know, I guess the, that part you spoke to, but a little more, a little more in depth with the scuba dive. So again, thank you, Stefan. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Faith. And um, we will see you all next week. Thank you.